Well, welcome back to our series called The Unsaved Christian. Now those two words don't sound like they should go together, and that's because they shouldn't. When we say the word Christian, it should mean someone who has trusted Jesus Christ as their forgiver of sin, as their Savior from hell. Someone who has made a decision to follow Jesus and to live a Jesus-centered life. That's what the word Christian is supposed to mean. And yet there are a lot of people who would identify themselves as Christian, and yet they have no interest in following Jesus. They would say, I believe in God, but I live like He doesn't exist. Last week we looked at this passage from Titus chapter 1, verse 15 says, Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving, because their minds, their consciences are corrupted. And we ask, well, who are we talking about here? Are we talking about criminals? Are we talking about murderers? Are we talking about drug dealers? Who are we talking about here? These, these must be pretty terrible people that, that don't know God, that don't uh, have any interest in God, right? Who reject His existence, right? That must be who we're talking about here. But verse 16 identifies who we're talking about. Such people claim they know God. But they deny Him by the way that they live, and they're detestable, they're disobedient, they're worthless for doing anything good. I believe in God. I believe in God. Yeah, I live like He doesn't exist. Is that a problem? Imagine that you were meeting a friend for lunch, and uh, you show up at the restaurant, you know, you're a little early, you're on time, and, and so you get the table, you sit down, and it's like, oh my... Uh, they're a little late, 10 minutes goes by, 20 minutes, like 45 minutes goes by. I'm like, where's your friend? You, know, you don't get a phone call, no text. I mean, you're getting kind of worried. And finally, your, your friend shows up. It's like 45, 50 minutes late, and they sit down, and you know, they'll go okay. And they say, I'm really, really sorry. I'm so sorry that I'm late. I, I left in plenty of time. I would have been on time, except I was crossing the street, and I got hit by a dump truck going 70 mile an hour. And, you know, I, the, the police showed up, the ambulance was there, I had to sign a bunch of papers, it was a whole thing. So, sorry. Well, you would know in that moment that your friend is either lying to you, they're trying to deceive you, or your friend is delusional because you don't get hit by a dump truck going 70 mile an hour and look the same as you did before, right? I believe in God. I'm a Christian. Your life doesn't look any, any different than it, than it did before you were a Christian, supposedly. We see this in so many Americans' lives that say that they are born-again Christians. Right? I'm a born-again Christian. And they don't look any different from the world around them. They're, they're no more committed to following Jesus than a Muslim or an atheist is. Hmm. That's what we mean by this phrase, this term, unsaved Christian. Or uh, we talked about the book that uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle wrote called The Christian Atheist. That's the term that he uses uh, or the term cultural Christian that comes out of uh, Dean and Sarah's uh, book, The Unsaved, The Unsaved Christian. And last week we talked about the difference between knowing things about God and actually knowing God. And those are two different things. To really know the heart of God, to be pursuing an intimate relationship with Him is very different than just knowing some facts about God. Today, we're going to talk about another term. So we've, we've discussed you know, cultural Christianity, you know, Christian atheism, this unsaved Christian. We're going to add and build on, on what we talked about last week. And we're going to talk about this phrase, this, um, this term today, customized Christianity. Customized Christianity. Saying, listen, I believe in God. Absolutely, I believe in God. But I'm going to take the parts of God that I like, 
All right, I'll take this and I'll take that, thank you. And I'm going to reject all the things that I don't like about God. I'm going to reject all the things you know, that Jesus you know, did or said to do or the things that are in the Bible. No, I, if I don't like it, I'm going to pass on it. I believe in God, but I'm only going to take the things about Him that I like. That's customized Christianity. For those of you who are younger than me, you probably don't, you know, know that this uh, was a part of our history in this country, but there was a time in our country when uh, coffee was, was just coffee, right? You had, you had two basic companies. You could either get Folgers or you could get Maxwell House. Those were the two main places you could get coffee. And it was basically, do you want regular decaf? You want regular or decaf? You could go to McDonald's, Burger King, Dunkin' Donuts, and it wasn't all of these different selections and, you know, build your own coffee. It was, you want, you want regular or you want decaf, right? And Starbucks came along and, and, and just wrecked the whole simplicity of ordering coffee. And now it's like, you know, do you want whole milk? Do you want skim milk? Do you want 2% milk? Do you want coconut milk? Do you want almond milk? Do you want soy milk? Do you want some drizzle of caramel on there? Do you want some drizzle of, of chocolate? Do you want whipped cream? Right? Do you want it hot or do you want it frozen? You want s'mores? You look like you could use a s'mores flavored coffee. Just give me coffee. I just, I just want coffee. Right? And, and this customization in our culture has, has been running through almost everything. You can customize your shoes. You can, you can customize the car that you want. Right? You can customize ice cream. It's not just you know, the, the, the three or four basic flavors anymore. Right? You can go to a place and you can actually build uh, your ice cream with different things that you want in it and all these different flavors. You can customize just about anything nowadays. You know, even, even dating is, is becoming customized. The percentage of people who are meeting uh, online is huge now. Right? It used to be that you would meet people through family and friends. Right? And that's just very few people meet and start dating that way anymore. It's, it's uh, the huge amount of people that are doing this online. And they can customize. I want this, this, and this in a boyfriend. I want this, this, and this in a girlfriend. Right? I'm not saying it's necessarily good or bad, this, the customization uh, of things in, in our everyday lives. I guess there's some value in that. But people are trying to do that with Christianity. They want a Christian. They want. They want to customize their Christianity. They want to Christ, uh, They want to customize God. They they want to customize him into what they want him to be, rather than actually getting to know who he is. They're saying, "I believe in God, but I'm going to take the parts of God that I like, and I'm going to I'm going to pass on the rest." I'll take His love, I, I like His love, I like His mercy and His grace, right? And I like His blessings, I'll take that and that. But I'll pass on the standards and the wrath and the judgment and the discipline, no thanks. I'll hard, I'll hard pass on those things. The Bible says that, that Jesus wants me to take up my cross and follow him? Are you kidding me? That sounds hard. No thanks. I'll take the Jesus that told everybody to back off from the woman caught in adultery. Let her alone. Back off. You're all sinners too. I'll, I'll take that Jesus. I'll pause on the part of the story when he turns to her and he says, Now go and leave your life of sin. I'll pause. I'll leave that part of the story out. And I'll just focus on the don't judge me Jesus. I go to the Bible and I, you know, I, I love verses like Jeremiah 29, 11. Love that verse. When God says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Love that. I'll take that. Thank you. But the verses that talk about sexual purity, pass. I'm not going to stop sleeping with my girlfriend. Forget it. I'm not giving that up. You know, I, I love the verses that talk about 
you know, the blessings of God. And, you know, He's going to prosper you. I love those. Those are great verses. But the verses that talk about, you know, living a life of generosity and tithing, no thanks. You're not getting me to do that. I love verses that talk about fellowship and, and, and uh, you know, the, the love of, of one another. Those are great verses. But this whole idea uh, of committing myself to, to live life with other believers and, and to gather with them, to worship and to live life with them on a regular basis, forget it. I work hard all week. Right? The weekend is mine. You expect me to show up every weekend? Are you kidding me? Last week, I introduced you to those two books, The Unsaved Christian and The Christian Atheist. And I want to introduce you to another book uh, this week. It's called Follow Me. It's by David Platt. Really would recommend that you pick up that book. It's a really uh, easy read, really profound explanation uh, of the gospel. And uh, I think it would be worth your while to order that book. You can get on our website. There's actually a link that I have uh, on the notes page uh, for you to get on that and find that very easily on Amazon to order that. But I wanted to read to you a, an excerpt, just a small excerpt from his book, Follow Me by David Platt. He writes this about customized Christianity. Customized Christianity revolves around a personal Christ that we create for ourselves. We have a tendency to redefine Christianity according to our own tastes and preferences and church traditions and cultural norms. Slowly, subtly, we take the Jesus of the Bible and we twist him into someone with whom we are a little more comfortable. We dilute what he says about the cost of following him. We disregard what he says about those who choose not to follow him. We pick and choose what we like and what we don't like from Jesus' teachings. And in the end, we create a nice, non-offensive, politically correct, middle-class American Jesus who looks just like us and thinks just like us. But Jesus is not customizable. You don't have the right to customize Him. So then why would people think it's okay to do that? Why is it that people think that it's okay to pick and choose and customize the Bible or try to customize God? Or to customize Jesus and His teachings. I like this, but I don't like that. I think the answer can be found in Psalm 36. If you look at Psalm 36, I think this gives us some insight into why this happens. Psalm 36, verse 1. Sin. Ultimately, that's the problem. Sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. They have no fear of God at all. There's the problem. They have no fear of God. Well, what's the result of having no fear of God? Well, in their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. They can't see it. They don't see how wicked their mind is and their behaviors, and their speech, and their attitudes, they don't see it. It's not a problem. Why? They have no fear of God. When you truly fear God, you want to obey Him without conditions. It's not, well, I'll do this, but not this. I'll do this if, if this. There's no conditions. You just obey God if you fear Him. You don't try to customize God. You don't try to customize the Bible. Here's what I'm hoping that you'll take with you to remember and to put into practice in your life today and, and moving forward. It's this, that those who do not pursue obedience to God, they don't fear God. And if you don't fear God, then you don't really know God. And sometimes that means you don't know Him at all, and sometimes that means you don't really know the heart of God. But if you don't fear God, you can't really say that you know Him. And I want to pause at this point and just clearly, as best as I'm able to, define what we mean by the fear of God from a biblical perspective. Because I think that word or that phrase, you know, fear of God, 
uh, can be confusing to some, or maybe it, it has, um, if you don't really understand a biblical perspective of it, it can kind of get diluted or uh, kind of turn into things that it's not supposed to mean. So, for example, many years ago, there were a lot of churches who were known for not having a lot of love, not having, you know, like having no grace, just this hard focus on legalistic rules. You follow all the rules. Some of them are in the Bible. Some are ones that we just made up. But you, you follow the rules, you're going to hell. Right? No love, no grace, just this hard focus on all this legalism. And uh, what that has a tendency to do uh, is, is pile on unnecessary guilt. And it also has a tendency for people to start putting their faith and their trust in their good behavior. I follow the rules, therefore I'm right with God. Right? And they're not putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the blood that He shed for them. They're not putting their faith in the grace of God, like the Bible teaches us to for salvation, but rather in their, in their moral standards right? and their, and their behaviors that they have deemed as, as righteous. And it's a self-righteousness that develops out of that. So that's a problem. Uh, but then, uh, then the, the pendulum began to swing. In reaction to that, you know, no love, no grace, that's terrible. And so the pendulum began to swing way over to the other side. And, and this great emphasis was placed on, on God's love and God's kindness and God's grace to the point where it was like, you know, just do whatever you want. Just live however you want. God loves you. And then books started being written on, we don't think hell even exists. right? People who, who are saying that they're Christians rejecting the existence of hell. And they're writing books about it. And then they're saying, well, if it does exist, if it's not just metaphorical, uh, then you know, God's loving uh, to the point where he's not going to send anybody there forever. Right? Christian authors writing these things. And so what happened, uh, the pendulum got way over here and it became like this license to sin. Just live however you want. Just do whatever you want. God's loving. He's not going to do anything to you permanently. And that's not biblical either. And so we don't want to take this conversation of the fear of God in, into either one of those places of legalism or uh, into to license. That's not a, a biblical or healthy place to take this conversation. Um, it's not who God is. God is truth and He's grace. He's both of those in equal measure. He's not, he's not 20% one and 80% the other. He's 100% to the full measure of both truth and grace. He is both, God, he is both justice and mercy. God is both of those to the full measure. God is righteous and He's forgiving to the full measure of both. God is love, yes, but God is also judgment and discipline. We have to be willing to work hard to keep balance in that tension in both the holiness and the grace of God. We have, to, we have to keep that in a place that is healthy and biblical. And I, I think in order to do that, if we understand a biblical understanding or a biblical definition of what we mean by the fear of God, I, I think that will help us. And, and I would use these two words. You can write these down in your notes. I would use the two words, love and respect. Love and respect equals the fear of God from a biblical perspective. Now, this isn't going to be a perfect illustration, uh, but I do hope it helps paint a picture of what we mean when we talk about love and respect in relationship to how we are defining the fear of God. My grandfather uh, was just an amazing man of integrity. He was a man who was worthy of respect. Uh, he was also very loving. Um, when you would leave his house, uh, he would always give you a hug and tell you that he loved you. And uh, he, had a, he had a great sense of humor. He was the kind of man that you just enjoyed spending time with. Um, but he was also a man who expected you to do the right thing and to do things the right way. He's the one who taught me to put my tools away where they belong, to not just leave them in a pile uh, where you can't find them the next time or maybe where they'll get uh, ruined from being left out, uh, but just do things the right way. The, the project isn't finished 
until the tools are put away where they belong. Do things the right way. Uh, he's the one who taught me when you're uh, doing a garden. He had this beautiful garden in his backyard. And you need to weed a garden. You need to pick rocks out of the garden. And that's not always a fun thing to do. Um, it's not always uh, an easy thing to do, but it needs done, and it needs to be done to completion. You don't just pick rocks uh, until you're bored. You don't just pick rocks out of the garden uh, until you get too hot or you're tired of doing it. It needs to be completed. You need to get, get all the rocks. Do things the right way. And I, I loved my grandfather. I was, I was very close to him. Uh, he was someone that I knew I could always be open and honest with. And I never wanted to disappoint him. I never wanted to do anything or say anything that would in any way hurt him. I loved him, and I had a high respect for him. And that's, I think, somewhat of what I'm trying to communicate to you when we're thinking about the fear of God, that we need to have a love for him. There's, the, there's an in, intimate relationship that we're pursuing with him, but he's God. And we have to make sure that we also maintain a high level of respect for God. Love and respect. That's what the fear of God looks like from a biblical perspective. If I could take you to John chapter 14 to illustrate this further. John chapter 14, starting in verse 23. Jesus said this, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. But anyone who does not love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. Those who do not pursue obedience to God don't fear God. And when we don't fear God, we don't really know God. Either in the sense that we don't know Him at all, or in the sense that we don't really know His heart because we're not pursuing an intimate relationship with Him. I think for some of you, maybe talking about the fear of God makes you uncomfortable, or maybe it even causes you to be afraid uh, because you think of this conversation in terms of just being negative. And that could be just because you want to do your own thing, right? You don't want uh, to have to surrender your life and, and your desires and uh, your mind. You don't want to have to be told what to do by God, right? And so for, for you, this conversation makes you uncomfortable because you resist the idea of obedience to God, right? But for some of you, it just could be that you haven't had really an understanding from a biblical perspective of the fear of God, and you only hear that word in, in the context of, I'm afraid of spiders, or, I'm afraid of snakes, and I have a fear of heights. And so it's a negative thing when you hear the word fear, and you put it into that context. Uh, but actually, uh, the fear of God from a biblical context is a very positive thing. It's a very positive thing. If I could take you on a brief tour through the Proverbs, if you would go there with me to Proverbs. We're going to start in Proverbs 8. Look at verse 12 with me. Proverbs 8, 12. I'm sorry, verse 13. Verse 13. Proverbs 8, 13. All who fear the Lord will hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance, corruption and perverse speech. Now, do you think it's a good thing? For a person to hate wickedness and evil, to hate uh, perverse speech, to hate pride and arrogance, is that a good thing? Or do you think it's a good thing that you would love those things, that you would want those things in your lives? Well, of course not. And the fear of the Lord is, is what motivates us, motivates our hearts to want to stay far away from evil and pride and arrogance and corruption and perverse speech. It's the fear of the Lord. That, uh, that tells our heart, you don't want to be anywhere near that stuff. Chapter 9, verse 10. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Well, which would you rather have? Would you rather have wisdom and good judgment in life? 
Oh, no, I don't really want wisdom and good judgment. I'd rather be a fool. Well, of course, I think most of us would say, yeah, if I had a choice between being a fool and being wise and having bad judgment or good judgment, sign me up for the good judgment and wisdom. Where does it come from? It comes from the fear of the Lord. Chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 27. Fear of the Lord is a life-giving fountain. It offers escape from the snares of death. Life-giving fountain. Uh, no, that doesn't sound like anything I might be interested in. I think I'd rather have you know, heartache in life brought on by my bad decisions. I'd rather have unnecessary stress in my life because I don't have good judgment or wisdom. Right? It's a good thing to have the fear of the Lord. It results in things like having this life, this abundant life that is a result of fearing God. One more. Chapter 22, verse 4. True humility and fear of the Lord lead to riches, honor, and long life. Now, why would anyone want those things, right? That sounds really boring, doesn't it? Give me broken relationship. Give me heartache and, and unnecessary stress in my life. Well, no. What we're talking about here is the fear of God leads to really good positive things in our lives. This is something that we should want to pursue. Because it benefits us to fear God. Those who do not pursue obedience to God don't really fear God. And if we don't really fear God... You can't say that you really know God. You don't really know His heart. You don't really love Him or respect Him. Because to love Him and respect Him and to know the heart of God makes us want to be obedient to Him because we know that the heart of God is to give us good things. That's why the boundaries and the standards that God has established are there. They're there to protect us and, and to, uh, to help us live in such a way uh, to avoid unnecessary stress. There's enough stress and heartache in this broken, sinful world than, uh, than to bring that on ourselves with poor judgment and, and, and bad choices. And the fear of God, obedience to God, loving and respecting God, uh, that keeps us in this, in this place where we want to obey Him. We want to live within His boundaries. Do you want to know how you could measure where you're at when it comes to the fear of God? It's really not that hard of a, of a measuring stick. All you really have to do is look at your level of obedience to God. And that'll tell you, that'll be a really good indicator of where you're at when it comes to love and respect of God. If your obedience is partial, right? I will obey this and I will obey that. Uh, this, this, and this, no thanks. Hard pass on those things because I don't like it. And I don't want to uh, surrender to these things for whatever reasons. If your level of obedience is partial, if it's delayed, if it's conditional, if it's customized, then you don't really fear God. That's customized Christianity. That's saying, saying I believe in God, but I want to customize Him. I want to customize the Word of God. I want to live like he doesn't exist. Craig Rochelle, in that book I was telling you about, The Christian Atheist, writes this. This is how he would define the fear of the Lord. It's an ongoing attitude of my heart that moves me to choose over and over again to obey God, even when it would be easier to do something else. So what do we do with all of this? How do we take what we've talked about today and apply it in our lives so it's something that we can use tomorrow and throughout this week and, and throughout our lives? Well, I think the first question that we need to ask ourselves is just the baseline question. Do I really know God? Do I really know God? Yeah, I, I know some things about Him. I've heard some stories from the Bible. But do I really know Him? Listen to me carefully. To be a Christian... It's not a, custom, a customizable thing. It's not, well, build your own 
uh, faith beliefs. Take what you like about Jesus. You can leave the rest, pass on the stuff that you don't like. That's not how it works. That's not what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to realize that in your sin you are separated from a holy God. And really you deserve nothing but God's wrath. That's what we deserve. To be a Christian is to believe that Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice for our sin. And that He rose from the dead, proving His victory over sin and over death. To be a Christian is to accept God, His his invitation of grace, and to choose to follow Jesus. To let Jesus change your life by the power of His Spirit. And we do hope that you'll take that that step of faith today. You can click the button that says, I'm ready at the bottom of the notes page today. You can, uh, if you want to explore the gospel more, I really would encourage you to uh, use that link to buy the book, Follow Me. I think the explanation of the gospel in there is tremendous. And that might be a really good thing to invest in. The second question I would uh, challenge you to think through with me this morning is, Uh, If you have accepted the gift of God's grace and you have uh, trusted Jesus Christ as your forgiver, as your Savior, you believe in God, this is good, but have you been trying to customize Him? Have you been trying to customize the things that Jesus taught? I'll take the things I like and I'll pass on the things that are too hard. Have you been trying to customize the Bible? I like this, this, and this. I like the positive blessings. I'll take all of that. But the stuff that, that's hard to follow, the stuff that doesn't fit with my lifestyle, the things that I want to do, I'll, heck, I'll take a hard pass. Have you been trying to customize the Bible? You believe in God and that's good. But does your life look any different from an atheist? Does your life look any different from, from those who say they don't even believe that God Exists. I mean, if someone followed you around for a 24-hour period or maybe for a week or maybe they, they, uh, they just really closely followed your social media post for about a month, would they come to the conclusion at the end of that time of observing your life? Well, clearly, this is a follower of Jesus. There's no doubt about it. Or would they come to some other conclusion? Would they be not able to tell any difference from your life, from your social media presence, from someone who says they don't even believe that God exists. You believe in God and that's good, but do you fear Him? Do you fear Him? Do you really love Him? Do you really hold Him in high respect? Are you pursuing a Jesus-centered life? Are you pursuing a self-centered life? A customized Christianity? If you're not obeying God, if you can identify some area of your life where you're just just not being obedient, and you know it, you don't need someone to come alongside and point out, you you, you know it. If you're aware of it, that's a really good first step, to be aware of it. But what are you going to do about it, right? If if all you're going to do is say, yeah, I, I know that I'm being disobedient in this area of my life, I guess it's good that you recognize it, but if you're not going to do anything about it, If you're just going to continue to customize your Christianity, then you can't really say that you're fearing God. You can't really say that you love Him. You can't really say that you respect Him. You can't really say that you know the heart of God. Because if you did, if you did, man, there would be no compromise. There'd be no customization. There'd be no, uh, well, I'll do this and this, but not that because that's too hard. That wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be part of your mindset. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. I'm not perfect. I fail. You're going, to, you're going to mess up and fall short. But is the desire of your heart to be obedient? Is that the, is that the direction that your heart is moving in? Because you love God and because you have a high respect for Him. Do you really fear God? It's a good thing because that's going to result in wisdom and and an abundant life and and good judgment and staying far away from the things that are going to cause uh, heartache and harm 
and broken relationships and all kinds of messed up stuff that sin does. Let me pray for you.